Okay, so let's get started. Uh, today will be really the third presentation on the nervous system. So the first one was done on your own, uh, the introduction of the nervous system, that was chapter 11. Last time we got through most of, but not quite all of the spinal cord. I owe you just the last little bit. And then we'll continue into chapter 13 on the brain. We'll be on the brain today, and we'll be on the brain some on Wednesday for sure. And then the very last part of Wednesday, we'll be covering a little bit over the autonomic nervous system. Not a lot, not a lot. In fact, not even all the notes you have. And um, so that'll cover all the material for exam number four. And this exam is on the nervous system, and that exam is next Monday, isn't it? So a week from today, exam. And that's going to cover vocabulary 51 through 70 as well. So any logistical questions? And then after all that, your short papers do after that, right? Your short papers do on the 22nd, right? Or any time between now and then. If you've already turned it in, fantastic. Uh, you'll turn in a hard copy as well as upload it to SafeAssign. You also have what else is going on this week that you could be working on? Take home exams. Not not it's not due until after the nervous system exam, but I would recommend at least knocking off a good part of it before you start really focusing in on the nervous system so that you're not looking at it completely empty when you come off your nervous system exam next week. So I think you have a few extra days after the nervous system exam to finish it. So I try to get off, you know, 75, 80% of it done and just have the last few questions or even get it all done before next week. But I wouldn't want to stare that assignment um, from scratch, from start, after the nervous system exam next week. Any logistical questions for me? Okay, let's keep moving, and then I'll answer any questions you may have about the spinal cord before we keep moving. So vocabulary, last time I think I got through 60 with you. I'll go 60 through 65 or so with you today. That'll leave the last five or so slides for you on Wednesday. So what do we have here? Nodo. Um, in the, in the, during development, there is the nodal cord. The nodal cord basically is a primitive backbone. So you may hear about the nodal cord. Uh, neuro, we know that term now pretty well. It refers really to nerve. Neurons are the cells that make up nerves, nerve cells. Neurolemma, what does that term mean? Remember, lemma means rind or peel? So the outside of a muscle cell was called the sarcolemma. The outside of a neuron is called the neurolemma. Okay. Uh, OB, against or toward or in front of. What most fundamentally what this makes sense is the obturator. You've seen the obturator foramen. You know there's an obturator nerve that travels through that big opening. And um, that's really all you need to think about, just against or toward. And then OC also is against. If you go to the dentist and they say you have a malocclusion, what are they telling you? Mal means bad. Occlusion, where your teeth come against each other. So a malocclusion is where your, your upper and lower teeth just are not matching up very nicely. So they might throw you into orthodontia to help align your jaws together. Oculo, we've had the orbicularis oculi. And also ophthalm, they both refer to the eye. Today we'll be talking about the ocular motor nerve. You'll hear me say that. In fact, today I need someone, if I'm not aware of it, I need someone to kind of about an hour and a half from now at 5.35 or so. I need someone to make note of that time, if you wouldn't mind, because I need to make sure I get over to the cranial nerves today. Okay, so I may be talking about, I will definitely be talking about the ocular motor nerve today. Ophthalmology is a study of eye disorders, and orbicularis oculi, we know that one. So we've seen that term. Odonto, where did we see this before? Odontoid process, we know that better as the dens. That was that tooth-shaped process on what bone? C1 or C2? C2, nicknamed the axis. Oid, something ends in oid means in the shape of, sigmoid, uh, in the shape of an S. Um, what else have we had? Um, we've had a lot of oids. Odontoid, right, in the shape of a tooth. And then ol, arterioles are small arteries. Um, so we'll see any oles mean little. Oligo, few, deficient, or little. 
oligodendrocytes, right? Oligo, a few, dendro, tree-like structures. What do oligodendrocytes produce? Myelin in the CNS. And what's, the, what's that look like in the CNS? One cell, one oligodendrocyte, reaches out with a few tree-like branches and myelinates the axons. Um, oligouria would be a condition where there was limited or little or deficient urine. So a person who's not having much output would have oligouria. Oma, some sort of neuroma, osteosarcoma, any kind of oma term refers usually to a tumor or some sort of mass. Onco, cancer. Oncogenes would be genes that we know are contributing to the formation of cancer. OO and OV both refer to the egg. So the oocyte or the ovum are re referring to the egg. OP, optics, vision, and ophthalm, the eye. So ophthalmology, the, the study of the eye. Opsy, the viewing of something. And there's three different terms here. An autopsy. Remember what auto means? Self, right? Uh, automobile, therefore, means what? The moving of self, right? You and me, automobile. Um, so autopsy would be the viewing of self. Not like you're looking at yourself, but the viewing of one's own species, right? Looking at another human. Versus a necropsy is typically a term given to looking at another animal, right? A death of an animal. Or dead tissue, necrotic tissue, looking at a necropsy. And then finally, biopsy. Bio, we know, means living. So a biopsy would be the viewing of living tissue. So we take a biopsy, we take a look at those living cells, usually to see if there's cancer. And then OR, oral, referring to the mouth. And then lastly today, orbi, an orbit, around, going around circuit, circle. Orchid, this one may not be in your top 10 list. Orchid refers to the testis. Um, orchidotomy or orchitis would be inflammation of uh, the testis. Ortho, we go to orthodontist to straighten our teeth, and ori pertaining to sensory, pertaining to the senses. So that'll get us going, and then we're going to be finishing up with 70, going through phleb. Going through phleb, I'll go through those last five on Wednesday. 51 through 70 will be on exam number four next Monday. Okay, so let me take a look at spinal cord. And were, are there any questions at all about the spinal cord? Anything at all you can articulate right now? Anything at all? Or on the first chapter, right, the one we didn't get a chance to talk to in person. Anything on the neuron, the parts of the neuron, any of that conversation, or spinal cord structures? I'm going to go to my favorite slide, right? That one slide with the, the colored horns. And that was here, right? And I told you this is probably that one slide that I think pulls a lot of this together. Now, there's a lot of stuff in this slide, right, Brianna? Right? There's a lot of stuff built into this slide, isn't there? Okay. And so, is there anything looking at this? Anything at all to clarify? What do we see on here? Those four colored regions are here called what? Nuclei. Each of those four nuclei refers to what? What is a nucleus? Nucleus is a cluster of cell bodies found in the CNS. So what I find is a cluster of cell bodies. Now, in those four colored regions, those four colored regions represent the four divisions of the nervous system. The lighter blue represent the somatic sensory. The darker blue are the visceral sensory. In other words, everything coming in, remember, all of your sensory information is coming in where? It's coming in the spinal nerve, takes which branch? takes the sensory branch, the posterior root, and then travels into, quote, the back of the spinal cord. And where do those sensory neurons synapse? Onto cell bodies 
in those nuclei. Those are what kind of neurons that are being synapsed with? Interneurons, right? Those are the little interneurons that are found completely and wholly contained within the CNS. And then what are those little interneurons doing? We miss that picture here because we haven't talked about the brain yet. What's missing here is what? Information comes into the spinal cord, and then where does most of it go? Up to the brain. And that information's traveling up what? What do we call those groups of axons traveling up? Tracks. And those tracks are traveling in these regions called funiculi. So the funiculus is just the region, right? It's a lateral, a medial, and a posterior funiculus. And within the funiculus, what do we find? Tracks. And what are tracks, folks? Groups of, they're white, so they're groups of axons, right? We would call that same group of axons what? Out in, out in the peripheral. We call that group of axons a nerve. Right, but inside the CNS, we're going to call it instead a tract. Now, that information, some of it's going up to the spinal cord. What kind of information is traveling up? Sensory or motor? Sensory. So those sensory tracts are traveling up the white matter. And then talking to the brain. That's what's missing here. Right? We don't see it yet. And then the brain's going to make a decision. And then the brain's going to send information back down via descending tracks. Those descending tracks are carrying what kind of information? Motor. Instructions to move. Telling either a muscle to move or telling a gland to secrete. Now that information that comes back down the spinal cord is going to leave the spinal cord how? Out a motor neuron. So where are those motor neurons traveling out of the spinal cord? The ventral root out the front. So the motor instructions are coming out the front of the spinal cord. And then that information comes in two flavors, right? That information coming from the brain come down either is autonomic motor, which means it's going to what? We're going to talk about the autonomic nervous system lastly, but those are the involuntary things. So what kind of signals? Where are these signals going involuntarily? Smooth muscle and to cardiac muscle, the involuntary muscles, and to your glands. You don't choose to salivate, right? It is something done automatically for you. You don't choose to make stomach secretions. It is done for you. You don't choose to make pancreatic secretions. It is done for you as part of your autonomic nervous system. So those instructions are sent down through the autonomic side versus the somatic motor side. The somatic motor is going to what? And only what? One thing. Voluntary skeletal muscle, right? So all of your somatic motor neurons are traveling to motor, move your soma, your body. Somatic motor coming down and going to your voluntary muscles, your skeletal muscles, the ones that we named in lab, right? Everything from the obicularis oculi down to the tibialis anterior. All of those muscles that we named are all skeletal muscles. They're voluntary. You choose voluntarily to move them. That information is traveling through these somatic motor neurons. Now, all of these neuron types, all four neuron types are traveling together in a bundle called a nerve. Okay. Yes? I mean, it's a lot of new vocabulary, and it's all right here on this image. So again, this is the image that I think you need to stare at and kind of dissect and break down and really dig in here. Because this one, if you can talk through somebody through the layers of understanding here, you're in really good shape. Now, what else do we see on here? Just to point out a couple things. What is this bulge right here? Dorsal root or posterior root ganglion. What is inside? What is a ganglion? A group of cell bodies in the PNS. What are those cell bodies for? Those are cell bodies for all of the sensory neurons. And morphologically, shape-wise, we would say that all those cell bodies are unipolar. 
then what do we see? In the spinal cord, in the gray matter, we see that those sensory neurons are synapsing with other neurons. Those clusters of cell bodies are in the gray matter, aren't they? In the nuclei. And those cell bodies are what kind of, of neurons? Interneurons. Those are the neurons, they're the communicators, the ones in between. Again, what we don't see here is that many of those neurons are then communicating with the neurons going hanging up to the brain. That's just not shown here. And then finally, those interneurons come back down and they interact with the neurons of the motor neurons. See the cell bodies there? Those are the cell body motor neurons or the autonomic motor neurons. And those are sending signals out the anterior route out to your body, telling your body to move in some way. What type of, we've already said these are what? In the sensory neurons, they're all what? Unipolar? What about the interneurons and the motor neurons? What shape are they? I heard it. Moti, right? They have many dendrites. And the more dendrites that a neuron has, it tells you what? The more dendrites a neuron has, the more information that it can receive. And so you find that those processing neurons, the ones that are receiving all this information, are the interneurons and the motor neurons, and those are multipolar in their shape. What else? Anything else from this diagram to clarify? The interneurons are the thinkers, the processors, the integrators, absolutely. Right. Now, again, what's missing on this picture is the brain is nowhere on this image, right? But I need you to appreciate that there are signals going up to the brain and back down, all connected together. As we get to the brain, we'll figure this out more in a few minutes. But right now, we're only talking about the spinal cord in isolation. So we lose sight that these interneurons, they're not just little connectors between the incoming sensory and the outgoing motor. They're also interneurons that are traveling up. Those ascending neurons, those ascending tracks are also made up of interneurons. Those descending tracks, right? Those neurons in the descending tracks are also interneurons. They're found wholly within the spinal cord and the brain. They're traveling up and down the highway, but they're not poking out. Only the sensory neurons and the motor neurons poke in and out of the spinal cord, don't they? Everything else is inside and those would include the ones going up and down the spinal cord. Those are interneurons. Anything else to clarify? Good stuff. OK, let's keep going. And remember, too, that I started then talking about the sensory pathways, right, that we have regions of our skin called dermatomes. And we have different muscles that are turned on and controlled by different levels of our spinal nerves. How many plexuses are there in your body? Coming off the spinal cord, there's what? Four, right? Most superior are the cervical. What nerve did you need to know from the cervical plexus? Phrenic. Why is the phrenic important? I think I said it. C3, C4, C5, keep the diaphragm alive. So the phrenic nerve is so important to us because it is the one that controls your breathing. If you were to have a spinal cord injury above C3, C2, C1, way, way high in your neck, you would lose everything below it, wouldn't you? And if you had a spinal cord injury way up at C1 or C2, you would be necessarily on a respirator. You would have no control over your, your, over your diaphragm. Then the second plexus is the brachial plexus. And that was what nerves? Turn over a couple pages. What was the brachial plexus made up of nerves from C5 to T1? OK. And there were five nerves that came off the cervical plexus. Ulnar, median, radial, musculotaneous, and axillary, right? Those are the five same nerves you need to know from lab coming off the arm. Then the thoracic region, no plexus. The ribs. Ob keep those nerves, those intercostal nerves separated. Then we get down to the lumbar plexus. The lumbar plexus is what? L1 through L4. It travels down the front of the leg and creates 
or what two nerves? Femoral and the lateral cutaneous, right? Lateral, femoral cutaneous. Um, and then finally, there's the sacral plexus. That's what? L4 through S4. And those nerves travel down the back of the leg to form. The big one is the sciatic nerve. The sciatic nerve right above the back of the knee, the popliteal region, splits into the tibial and common fibular nerve. And there's also a little pedundal nerve that pops off from there that goes to your inter internal organs. And that got us through the plexuses, didn't it? Okay. And what else? That's where I stopped, isn't it? Now we have just about, you know, just a few more slides to go through on the spinal cord. Anything up to this point? Have you started doing your spinal cord homework? If you have, hopefully you're feeling more comfortable. If you haven't, I think you will feel more comfortable as you go through that content. So uh, please come as prepared as you can on Wednesday. I know that'll be our last chance to talk face to face, but if you can at least get through this, all the spinal cord homework and even start some of the brain homework so that you come in as prepared as possible to answer any hanging you know, ideas so we can deal with those in class. And then um, we'll finish up the content on Wednesday. So what is a reflex? I told you in the very first couple lectures, our first couple slides about the spinal cord, that the spinal cord was not only just a connector from the brain to the rest of your body, but also the spinal cord had its own job. And one of its autonomous jobs, one of its jo jobs that is all on, a, all, ugh, all on its own is control your reflexes. And reflexes, describe to me a reflex. It's automatic, really, really quick, repeatable, and doesn't happen so fast that it doesn't involve your brain. Right? That's the whole idea, that it's being controlled at the level of your spinal cord. So if, it took, if, if the body took longer for that signal to go up the spinal cord and made it, make a decision to come back down, you would probably sustain more damage. So you step on a nail, right? And before you know it, your foot's going to lift up away from that damage. You, you touch something hot. And before you even know it, before you even consciously tell your body to move away, your muscles are going to move away. That is the one time where your skeletal muscles become involuntary, don't they? Right? You touch a hot stove, you didn't tell your arm to pull back. Your spinal cord did. So it's not even voluntary at that point, right? All of a sudden, your voluntary muscles become involuntary for that very short period of time. Now, all reflexes have the same properties. There's a bunch of reflexes on your body. And a neurologist um, in the emergency room, if you were to fall off a ladder, they would look for all these reflexes to see if there's a problem with your spinal cord somewhere along the length of your spinal cord. But all reflexes, there's a stimulus. Now, probably the most common reflex that you're all familiar with is the patellar knee jerk reflex, right? You go to the doctor, they have your foot hanging over the, the, the table, they'll take their little hammer and they'll hit, right? This is fake, of course, right? They'll, they'll hit that little tendon. Now, what, what are they doing? We'll talk about that in a second, but that's a reflex. Do you have any control over that? No, it's very quick, it's automatic, it's repeatable. It's also, you know, uh, very uh, um, and, and involuntary. It's a very rapid response. It's an automatic response. It happens the same way every single time. No pre-awareness. You cannot, typically, you cannot suppress them. Now, we know that's not true completely, is it? The CIA, the CIA and the FBI depend upon your inability to, to, to uh, control these. When you're doing a lie detector test, what are they looking for? They're going to hook you up to some electrodes. If you tell a lie, what does your body normally do? Heart rate goes up, sweating increases, pupils change. There are a lot of things that happen automatically that they're looking for during those improper responses. Some people have been able to beat them, though, haven't they? So we know that sometimes reflexes can be controlled. What about at the luau? and you see the guy or the gal walking on glass, right? Or coal, coal walking, those crazy people, right? What have they done? They have somehow been learned how to suppress 
what would normally for you and me, I touch hot coals, I'm going to step off that darn thing. They have somehow learned how to suppress through practice their automatic responses. So typically these are not something that you can control, but we've all seen luau's where people, crazy people do that kind of thing. Um, the sword swallowers. I mean, all that kind of crazy stuff, right? They have practiced that and they have, in this case of the sword swallower, they've blocked the gag reflex, right? So we know it's possible, but not very common, okay? Usually not suppressed. And again, even before you were consciously aware of it, you've already done it. So you, hot, you touch a hot stove, or ladies, you hit a, a curling iron to your forehead, and even before you were aware that it was burning, you'd already pulled away, haven't you? So it's something that happens automatically. So, and I shouldn't be so sexist to say that guys don't use curling irons, right? Okay. Um, but what are the parts? Every day? Yeah, I've, I've noticed. Um, so the reflex arc, what, what's going on here? In other words, sensory information in, the arc is referring to sort of like, you know, the St. Louis arc, arch, if you will. It's coming into the spinal cord and right back out. Very fast, no brain power. Nothing's traveling up a sensory tract or down a motor tract. Now, eventually, are you aware that you burned yourself? Yeah. A, a second or so later, or even half a second later, you're all of a sudden aware that you burned yourself. But again, your body's already reacted before that happens. So there'll always be a receptor in the PNS, right? You burned yourself, something hot, something hot or attack, something that hurt you. Then it will communicate with the CNS. It's going to talk with, usually, an interneuron in the spinal cord. And then that spinal cord interneuron is going to do what? Say, hey, dummy, move. Right? But even before you're aware of it, so that means it's going to be an effector. Effector is a fancy way of saying the muscle or the gland that is affected by the signal. So five steps. Any reflex. Okay, here they are. One, two, three, four, five. Number one. Again, sensory receptor. You just touch something hot. There's hot and cold sensors in your finger. That signal is going to be traveling toward the spinal cord. It's a sensory signal, isn't it? It's going to go in and talk with an interneuron, usually. I'll show you an exception in a minute. Then that motor neuron is going to send the impulse out to the effector. The effector is either a muscle or a gland, and it's going to now release or secrete, do something in response. So let's get a picture of this. Number one, stimulus coming in. Oh, look, here's a good review, right? The sensory information comes in and does what? Comes in the spinal nerve, but then splits and goes toward the back. It comes in and goes toward the posterior root. In that ganglion, what do we see? I see the cell body, and that cell body will be what shape? Unipolar. What does that tell me? Again. When I touch something hot with my fingers, that signal is going to travel all the way up my arm to my spinal cord, and the cell body for that neuron is up there at the DRG, at the dorsal root ganglion. It goes into the spinal cord. There's my synapse. What's happening? The sensory neuron is now synapsing with the interneuron. The interneuron is not going to talk to the brain. It's going to make the decision for you. If that incoming information is noxious or painful or damaging to you, it's going to directly talk to the motor neuron. The motor neuron in the spinal cord is then going to send its instruction out through the ventral root, through the front side, to your effector, in this case, biceps brachii, okay. telling you to move, flex your arm. Good sense? Again, nothing here is showing with the brain because there is no brain power involved here. Now, there's two different basic types of reflex arcs. Number one, ipsilateral. We know these terms. Ipsilateral means on the same side. If I were to reach out with my left arm and burn my left hand and pull my left arm back in response to that burn, it's all happening on the same side of the body, I would call it an ipsilateral response. If instead I stepped on a rusty nail with my right foot and then not only did I lift up my right foot, but then I extended my left leg to catch my weight, that, because it involves both sides of the spinal cord, would be considered a contralateral reflex. They're more involved, and I'll show you the wiring on this in a moment. Um, because it does involve both sides, it 
does take a split second longer for it to occur. There are more neurons involved, but still faster than if you had to wait for the brain to tell you about it. So ipsilateral versus contralateral. I'll show you a picture of those in a moment. Let me also break it down another way. Monosynaptic versus polysynaptic. Monosynaptic, what does that word tell you? One synapse. In the pictures I've shown you so far of a reflex, how many synapses were there? There was the incoming sensory. It synapsed with the interneuron. The interneuron then synapsed with the motor neuron. There were two synapses, weren't there? In the simplest of all reflexes, there's one synapse. In order for that to happen, there's no interneuron. The incoming sensory neuron speaks directly to the outgoing motor neuron. That circuitry is what happens in the patellar knee jerk. So this is the most basic of all reflexes. It is a monosynaptic reflex. Fast, very, really, I don't know of any way that anyone can suppress this one because there is no interneuron involved. And I'll show you that in a moment. Now what happens, and we'll get into this a little bit more in a moment, but if I tap on my patellar tendon or ligament, Remember, that's the, you get your quadriceps femoris muscles coming around. They go around the patella, and those muscles insert onto what? What's this bump on the front of my tibia? Tibiotuberosity. If you take a hammer and you hit that tendon ligament coming across, what does the muscle think just happened? The muscle says, hey, I just got stretched. But I wasn't expecting it. So what, would, what do you do in your life when you get stretched? Usually we kind of fight back, right? So when that muscle gets stretched unexpectedly, you didn't tell it to, right? It happened. Something hit it unexpectedly. That muscle says to itself, self, I'm going to resist that stretch. That's exactly what a reflex does. So when that, when that patellar tendon gets stretched, that muscle, your quadriceps femoris muscle say, Whoa, wait a second, I didn't tell it to stretch. And it jerks back in response. Well, what happens when your quadriceps femoris muscles contract? Your leg extends, right? Remember, your quadriceps are extensors. Your hamstrings are flexors. And so when your quadriceps femoris muscles respond to that stretch, they cause your leg to kick out and stretch. So that produces that kick. Now, most reflexes are polysynaptic, two or more. That's the pictures I've shown you. I've shown you a sensory talking to an interneuron, the interneuron talking to the motor neuron, two or more. We'll call that polysynaptic. So let's look at the, the wiring of this. Here is your monosynaptic knee jerk reflex. I hit it, look what happens. That muscle says, hey, I just got stretched. That signal comes in and talks directly to your motor neuron. There's no interneuron involved. One synapse, monosynaptic, fastest, least resistant, you know, the, the least uh, uh, adaptable type of reflex. And out it goes, okay, to, in this case, your quadriceps femoris muscles in your thigh. Polysynaptic, this is what I was showing you before. There's a flame right here. You're burning yourself, <laughs> dummy, right? So you feel pain, and so that signal comes in, goes up, talks to your interneuron, interneuron talks to your muscle, comes out and tells your biceps brachii to do what? Flex, move away from that heat, move away from the pain. Polysynaptic because two or more synapses involved. Slightly slower, but still amazingly fast. Now, how does this happen? Stretch reflexes. There are, I've already alluded to this, in your Oops, in your muscles, um, there is an area that is controlling how long your muscles are. And if you stretch your muscle unexpectedly, right, because all these muscles are voluntary, right? So if you're gonna if you're gonna tell your biceps brachii to flex, it's because you told it to. But if all of a sudden, or if I tell my if I tell my quadriceps femoris muscles to flex, right, I'm gonna extend my leg. But if all of a sudden something hits that patellar tendon 
and that muscle is, quote, stretched without it being told to or without its knowledge, then it will cause a reflex. And that reflex is going to be to contract that muscle. I like this figure because it does something for the very first time uh, that I haven't said but is important in this little conversation. When I say sensory and motor, right, we think about the two different sides of the nervous system. And if I say muscle, you think probably by default that muscle is motor, right? And that's true. But what I want you to realize is that your muscles are also sending sensory signals, okay? So yes, your muscles are receiving motor instruction to move, but your muscles are also sending out. See this outgoing? Your muscles are also sending outgoing sensory information. Now, what is that information telling your body? I use this word in the presentation that we didn't have live. And I said, you are aware of your position in space because of a long word that starts with the letter P, proprioception. Why is it that you can close your eyes and you know that your arm is straight or bent? You know your arms are straight or bent, why? Because unknowns to you, there are signals coming into your brain from your muscles telling you telling your, your central nervous system, your brain, is your, muscles, is your arm straight or bent? You know that without looking in the mirror, don't you? You know right now that your butt's on your chair and your legs are 90 degrees, essentially. You know that, even with your eyes closed, because your muscles are sending signals back to you, and that awareness of self is called your sense of proprioception. Proprio means self. So perception of your own position. And that signal, those signals are coming in in part by sensory neurons in your muscles and in your joint spaces. So if you stretch your muscle, it, your brain knows it and tells you to, to, to contract that muscle. But even here, not brain, right? I misspoke, didn't I? Because the reflex is based upon not your brain, but in your spinal cord. So it's happening so fast to protect you. Have you ever been watching some sort of world record uh, weightlifting contest, some Saturday afternoon thing, right? And um, you see a, a body lifter hold some ridiculous weight, right? They're lifting some massive weight. And no matter how hard they seem to want, their body systems to go limp, right? You ever seen this? You know, this, they're lifting some 700, 800 pounds, whatever they're doing, some deadlift. And all of a sudden, this, this you know, he-man from Russia or Belarus or someplace, right? All of a sudden is gonna drop this weight, seemingly, without control. Let's figure out what's going on there. There's also called the Golgi tendon reflex. This is a sensory neuron at the border of your muscle and tendon. What does the tendon do? What does the tendon do for you? Connects your muscles to your bones. What do we know about tendons? What are they made of? Under the microscope, we would say that they're made of dense, regular connective tissue. We know from the lab that they're very white. Why are they very white? Because there's little to no blood flow. If you tear or damage a tendon or ligament, it's a very slow heal. So the good Lord put little sensors in at the tendon muscle junction. If the tendon is getting stretched to the point where the body senses that the muscle may come detached from the bone, right? A complete tendon tear. These little sensors send a signal to the muscle and it tells that muscle, relax. It is autonomic, it is automatic, it is reflexive. So you are lifting this amazingly heavy weight and those reflexes kick in. And no matter what you, no matter how motivated you are to lift that thing, your muscle goes limp. That's a reflex, because what's the body protecting you against? Potentially tearing that muscle off the bone, right, which is a very slow heal. So that's what these Golgi tendon reflexes do. Now, this word Golgi, same as the Golgi apparatus, same guy, unfortunately, right? So it's still a capital G, it's still a Golgi. It's not the Golgi apparatus that we saw in the cell, but it's the same dude who described them, so the same name. Okay, this guy got a couple, got a, got a lot of traction. 
So here's a picture, a cartoon of a Golgi tendon organ. It sounds like, I don't know, organ sounds like a big thing, right? But it's basically a sensory neuron. That sensory neuron is at the muscle tendon junction. If this muscle is contracting so hard that it's about to pull this tendon off the bone, that sensory neuron sends a signal. It only goes to the spinal cord, doesn't it? And then the spinal cord sends a signal to the muscle telling it to do what? Relax. Involuntarily. No choice. No voluntary choice. The muscle goes limp. So this is, so, it, it, so when you, when you um, go to the doctor's office, or your kids, or yourself, typically the doctor will do a patellar knee jerk reflex. Uh, they'll take a little hammer out, right? They'll tap on your patellar tendon. And your knee kicks out. Have you ever had it not happen? Have, have you ever seen them miss it or not get a response? Or maybe from your own kids, if you have kids, or nephews, or nieces? I mean, every t I've always asked my doctor, why do you do this? I mean, I know why they do it. They're doing it to test to make sure you have normal neuromuscular function, right? That your spinal cord's intact, you don't have some weird disease going on. But why do they do it with my five-year-old, or my, now my seven-year-old kid, right? They just ran into the doctor's office. They jumped up onto the examination table at the pediatrician's office. I'm not complaining about their being clumsy or having any neuromuscular issues. They tap on the little patellar tendon. I swear, sometimes nothing happens. They, nothing responds, nothing really happens. And what does the doctor do? Do they get upset about it? No, they just keep on going, right? So I've always wondered why we go through that process. Because if I said to you, if I said, oh, my kid's been really clumsy. There's something, there's some neuromuscular thing. They just, they can't skip, they can't, you know, there's something, they're really clumsy. Then I would expect them to go through that training. But I've never understood why they go through it. I know they do it as a screening method. But if you hit that patellar tendon, you don't get it quite right and the kid never kicks out their leg, they don't get terribly excited about it, do they? Now, if I were had fallen off a ladder, or if I'd been in an automobile accident, then it makes sense when I go into the ER that they check my reflexes. And there's a set of reflexes all the way, not to memorize this, but your reflexes, there are reflexes that test different regions of your spinal cord. And tell me if this now Plantar. What does the word plantar mean to you? Bottom of the foot. Okay. Think about what what nerves are going down at the bottom of the foot. Going down the back of the foot. Do you agree that there would be lumbar and sacral nerves way to the bottom? So if I do testing on the bottom of the foot and I see a normal response, what does it tell me? That my lumbar and sacral nerves are okay. If I do a patellar knee jerk reflex and it's normal, what do we know? The nerves going down the front of the leg are coming from what? Plexus. Remember, the lumbar plexus goes down the front of the leg. If you go back and look at the dermatomes, you would see that L2, L3, L4 are the regions that come down across the thigh. So if we do the patellar knee jerk and everything seems normal, that means that my lumbar region of my spinal cord is intact. There's no issues. And I go up the ladder, right? And if I do a triceps reflex, then that means that my cervical, C6 and C7, is okay. You would want that to happen, right? If somebody falls off a ladder, had some trauma, you would want them to go systematically through your reflexes. Can you feel this? Can you feel that? Does everything seem to be normal? Your reflexes could be normal, yay. Or, going back, your reflexes could be hypoactive, not normal, underactive, right? And that would suggest that either you had damage to your spinal cord or maybe you had a muscle disease. So if you had a muscular dystrophy, some sort of degenerative muscle disease, and even though you hit the patellar tendon in the right place, the muscle was diseased and would not respond. So hypoactive reflex is either the spinal cord has damage or the muscle is diseased. If there was hyperactive reflex, if someone's spazzing, it also could mean uh, damage to the spinal cord or to the brain. So a person who's kind of spazzing and having spastic movement spinal cord injury, and or brain damage. So we want to do these reflexes in the right timing, right? We want to do these. I just always question why they have them, why they only check my kid's lumbar <laughs> region and why they go through the process. And when I ask my pediatrician, they just tell me, well, it's part of a normal, full workup. And I get that. But I would just always wonder why they put them through that. Okay. 
Any questions? That brings us to the end of spinal cord. Anything at all that I've said on spinal cord? Okay. I'm going to jump over to brain. And if anything comes to mind, please let me know. And a lot of what I've said, because it's still part of the central nervous system, is going to link into the brain. So I'm going to be saying some things almost again because what is true for the spinal cord is in part also true for the brain. Now we're doing well here. So about an hour, about an hour or so, I need someone to say, hey, wait a second. And I need to jump to the end of this. So if I'm not there naturally, I need to jump to the end of this presentation in an hour. Then I'll come back and finish up what I jump over on Wednesday. What's wrong with the labeling of this picture, Zach? Gotcha. What's wrong with the labeling of this picture? It says CNS, right? What is the CNS? Only the brain and spinal cord. What is this picture also showing? I'm seeing some nerves, right? So this would not be well labeled as CNS. I should instead just label this as the nervous system, right? Because I'm seeing both um, the spinal cord and the brain, that'd be CNS, but I also see popping out of it these 31 nerves. Now, when you look at this, what is this group of nerves coming off? You can actually see it. That would be what? Cervical plexus. And look at this group of nerves. Brachial plexus going off to the brain. And these would all be the intercostal, so they're not plexusing, if that's even a word, right? They're not traveling as a group. And Further down, what would I see? I'd see two more plexuses, wouldn't I? Lumbar and sacral. Question? Ah, this parallel structure right here, next chapter. Okay? Sympathetic system. So, something to do with the sympathetic nervous system. And we'll talk about that little string of, of uh, structures. And there's also something else that I haven't talked about directly, and that is not only do you have 31 pairs of nerves coming off the spinal cord, we know a little bit about them, right? Cervical 8, thoracic 12, lumbar 5, sacral 5, coccygeal 1. There's also 12 cranial nerves coming off from the cranium, and we'll be learning about those 12 cranial nerves today. That'll be the last thing we'll do. So this chapter is about the brain and the cranial nerves. Now, the brain is about three and a half pounds in average size male. Um, brain size is not related to intelligence. Neanderthal had bigger brains than modern humans. And what does account for the intelligence is the number of active synapses. So how many synapses do you have actively going on in your brain? As we age, the number of synapses does decrease, and that does eventually lead to dementia and some memory issues, perhaps. And as we're developing, we know that stimulation causes new synapses to be made. Right now, you are making new synapses because you're making new connections. This information that's coming in, you're, you're creating new connections, new synapses. Is it harder to learn when we're younger or older? It gets harder, right? It really is truly more difficult to learn when we get a little older, in part because the body does not as quickly make these new synapses. So kids are sponges. They grab all this stuff. These synapses are made so easily. As we get older, they don't get established quite as easy. It takes a little bit longer to get information into our head. And then as we age, we do start losing some of those connections. So we'll talk about that. Um, the brain, about three and a half pounds receives, though, although it's a relatively small organ, very important, it receives and requires about 25% of your oxygen. So it's an oxygen hog. Absolutely requires it. Doesn't matter if you're exercising or sitting, your brain is still going to require 25% of your oxygen. So, and if it doesn't get oxygen right, it's going to die very, very quickly. I should also say that men's brains are bigger. And that's just by anatomical fact, not a reflection on their use, right? So men have bigger brains, and that's just because we have bigger heads. Um, now, the brain is protected in largely the same way as the spinal cord. What were the layers around the spinal cord? 
the dura, the arachnoid, and the pia. Also, the spinal cord had vertebrae around it. Instead, bony. Now, instead, we have the cranium. So there are the cranial bones. We know all their names uh, that make up the face and the head. And we also have the same meninges, the same pad, P-A-D, that surround it. There's also fluid. Just like there was fluid around your spinal cord and down the center of your spinal cord in the central canal, so too your brain has fluid around it. Your brain is kind of sitting in this bucket of fluid up in your cranium. And you also have fluid inside your brain. So the spinal cord had that central canal. The brain also has fluid-filled chambers in the very center of it that also are, mimic that, that central canal. So we'll see the CSF being the same CSF. That CSF that flows through your spinal cord is completely continuous with the CSF of your brain. One thing that's additional, though, is that in addition to protect the brain, there is the blood-brain barrier. This is a specially difficult uh, barrier between your bloodstream and your brain tissue. And this sets up a, a more protective uh, barrier. Your spinal cord does not have quite the same uh, blood-brain barrier. Okay, so the meninges. Here I'm calling them the cranial meninges because they're around the brain. In the spinal cord, we would have called them the spinal meninges. It's the same thing. Okay, so this is review. There's a couple new things, though. You know there are these three meninges. They are not only to protect the brain, they're also to protect the blood vessels and the nerves that travel to the brain. Now, I just kind of misquoted. Nerves and tracks, right? The nerves that travel in as well as the tracks that are traveling within the brain. And we've got that CSF. That CSF is also being protected and maintained within the meninges. What we're also going to see, though, is that in the brain, there is an area where blood is draining back from the brain. In lab, we're just getting to the heart, and we're getting to blood vessels next week. But blood that's coming back from an organ would be what color? If it's going to an organ, it's oxygenated, and it would be bright red. Blood coming back from an organ has already dropped off its oxygen, and that blood coming back would be necessarily blue, right, in our cartoons and in our understanding. We're going to call that venous blood. It's coming back through a series of veins. What we're going to see is that part of the meninges, blood coming back from the brain, is going to pool in the meninges. We did not see that around the spinal cord. So there's a slight difference here in one of the properties of the meninges, and I'll show that to you in a moment. And finally, the same three layers, the dura, hard, arachnoid, spider-like, and pia, very delicate, shrink-wrapped pretty much to the surface of the brain. We'll go through this again. The dura, tough, hard, outer layer. Here's a distinction. It's actually two layers. In the spinal cord, one layer. In the, in the brain, though, it's actually made up of two layers. These two layers are referred to as the periosteal layer and the meningeal layer. So the periosteal must be next to the what? Bone, perio, osteo, right? Peri, osteo, around the bone. And the meningeal must be deeper next to, quote, the rest of the meninges. So don't make that harder than it is. And let me show you these two layers. Now, in between these two layers is where blood can accumulate. And these are called the venous sinuses, the dural venous sinuses. Dural because they're what? In between the layers of the dura. Venous because this blood is blue coming back from the brain. Sinus is a large space. So the dural venous sinuses. We'll come back to show you a picture of that. Then there's the arachnoid mater. You'll hear it called the arachnoid, the arachnoid membrane, or just the arachnoid. This is, do you agree, it's deep or internal to the dura. And what's right below, why is it called the arachnoid? Arachnid, it has the appearance of spider webs. And what those spider webs are, are really collagen and elastin fibers. And it kind of looks like a, a web. Okay. Now, that web, what's filled in that webby area, that's the space where what is found? 
Let me help you with that. So up here, I know it's small. There'll be a bit of bigger picture coming up. In that kind of webby space, there's a lot of space. It's in there that you would find CSF, cerebrospinal fluid. Now, let me quiz you back to the lecture we had offline. What cells make CSF? Ependymal, ep uh, ependymal cells, right? Uh, the ependymal. You'll hear it pronounced ependymal and ependymal. But those cells, right, the epi, they're like epithelial cells lining the fluid-filled chambers of the brain. Those are the cells that make the CSF. Now, pia, we'll put this all together in a second. We already know the pia. The pia is the innermost layer. It's a very delicate connective tissue layer. It is going to basically follow every groove. What do we call the grooves on the surface of the brain? Sulci, right? It's going to go into every groove and follow every bump on the brain, every gyrus. So it's going to follow every gyrus and sulci, sulcus on the surface of the brain. I always think of it as being a shrink-wrapped layer. Now, this image, I like it for a couple of reasons. Uh, the, the reason I really like this one is it does give me two different colors for the dura. Now, what do those two layers represent? The periosteal layer and the meningeal layer. Oh, I'm, I must take back what I just said. This figure does not show two colors. My bad. The next one does. This figure does not show two colors. This figure only shows a lighter green dura mater. It does not show the two layers. I Forgive me. The darker green layer is the arachnoid. Then we see that spider web space, and that is the subarachnoid space. That's where the CSF is found. Notice that that CSF is not only protecting the brain, it's also protecting the blood vessels that are traveling to and from the brain. And then shrink wrap to the brain itself in red, the pia mater. And notice how the pia mater, let me change colors, see how the pia mater goes down into the sulcus, right? It goes down into the groove, okay? Follows every groove of the brain. Now, very discreetly on this image, do you see two different colors I know your black and white handouts don't help. It says gray matter here. And do you see that there's sort of a gray outline here? Okay. That gray matter is the gray matter of your brain. Hmm. So that means that the gray matter of the brain is where? Toward the outside. How is this different from the spinal cord? In the spinal cord, the gray matter was the butterfly. It was in the center. The white matter was around the outside. In the brain, this thing flips, and in the brain, for the most part, the gray matter is around the outside of the brain. Now, what is the name for the outside of an organ? Cortex, okay? So we would say that the gray matter is in the cortex of the brain. Now, I'll show you another image of this. The, the pink stuff here would be white matter, right? All the stuff deep would be white matter. And what do we call the inside? If the cortex is the outside, the inside is the medulla. Where have we seen that term before, cortex and medulla? Bone. Remember bone? The inside was called the medulla, medullary cavity. The outside was called compact bone. But another name for compact bone is? cortical bone, because it's the bone of the cortex, the outer layer of the bone. Over and over and over, we're going to see this word cortex and medulla. When we get to the kidney, the outer layer, cortex, the inside, medulla. In the brain, outer layer, corte uh, cortex, inside, medulla. So we're going to see this over and over and over again. So that's one image of the meninges all in one. Here's the one that I like a little bit better. Let me back up. This one does show both layers of the dura. And this one also puts into perspective what's going on here with your scalp and your cranial bones. So let's kind of make it, take a look at this. I know it's small. So we got some scalp, right? Now, what kind of bone is your parietal bone? Let's say this is a, a click of your piece of your parietal bone. What kind of bone was it? It wasn't long bone, it was flat bone. Do you remember what flat bone was described as? A layer of compact bone with a layer of spongy bone in the middle, another layer of compact bone. 
So what you're looking at there is a piece of flat bone, okay? And this would be periosteum. So what is periosteum? The layer around the, the bone. So you got skin sitting on periosteum, sitting on flat bone. Then what's on the bottom side of that flat bone? Another layer of periosteum. That layer of periosteum is the periosteal layer of the dura. It's the same thing. So we see that there's the, the, the periosteal layer, and then the deeper layer is the meningeal layer. Co collectively, that's the dura. Now, normally, these two layers are one. They're fused together. You'd have a hard time telling them apart. But look what happens in a couple places in the brain. These two layers separate. And what's inside those two layers is that blue blood. So that blue blood is the dural venous sinus. It is blood coming back from the brain. It pools in these sections between the dura, between the periosteal and the meningeal layer. That's new, right? That we didn't see that in the spinal cord. Then everything else is the same. Then we have the arachnoid mater, right? With the spongy or the kind of spiderweb look. And then the pia mater. What I like about this picture is that it also shows the colors a little bit more true. This becomes what? Where my red line is going through the gray matter of the brain. That's the outer layer. We call that the cortex. The cortex, therefore, will be all the gyri, right? all the bumps and grooves of the brain, all that integrate, integ uh, uh, integ <laughs> complex, change the word. Right, all that complex gyri and sulci, that would all be the cortex. Then what do we have on the inside? The white matter, the medulla. So the gray matter is on the outside of the brain, the white matter is on the inside. That's flipped from the spinal cord. So now what I want to get into is some of the brain anatomy. Now in lab, we saw some of this although it was that day after the lab exam and our brains were a little bit fried, and you were looking at parts of the brain. Let me now walk you through what's important to me for the parts of the brain. You may also want to go back and just kind of look again at your Amerman book. I know we were quizzed on this. We saw the uh, lobes, cerebellum, cerebrum, but you may want to go back and look at the Amerman list, look at your lab list, and revisit this a little bit as we go through this anatomy. So the brain is divided up into the cerebrum, and each cerebrum, left and right, is further composed of five lobes. Can you name those lobes off for me? Frontal, parietal, temporal, occipital, and the one we can't see, the insula, right? So those are the five lobes. There's a left and a right pair. So really your brain is divided up into two halves, left and right, each half, each hemi uh, cerebrum, each hemisphere, is broken into five lobes. Then, this is a new word. It was in the lab list, but we didn't talk about it. If the brain was a peach, the fleshy portion of the peach would be your lobes. Right? The edible portion of the peach are the lobes. The pit of the peach would be the diencephalon. The pit, the core, the center of the peach, the center of the brain, is called the diencephalon. Here is where you find the thalamus and the hypothalamus. Can you picture the hypothalamus? Right, it's that little area. What hangs down below the hypothalamus? The pituitary. The pituitary. So you we're kind of in the pit, the core, the center of the brain. Then there's the brain stem. The brain stem is the most primitive part of your brain, and you've heard of the pons and the medulla oblongata. They are part of the brain stem. Then there's that part hanging off the back of the brain called the cerebellum. Those are the big parts. Each cerebrum is divided into left and right hemispheres. Left and right hemisphere, two hemispheres make up the whole brain. And again, in each hemisphere, there are five areas, each called a lobe. On the surface of the brain, we see gyri, the bumps, the noodles, separated by grooves called sulci. And coming off the brain, there are 12 pairs of cranial nerves. You know this. 
the gray matter is what? It's not myelinated. So what is it? Cell bodies. So where are the cell bodies in the brain? Around the cortex. They're around the outside edge. You with me? So all the cell bodies are toward the surface of your brain. They're in the cortex. I will say all but most. Now, the cortex is gray. Therefore, it's what? Cell bodies as well as dendrites. And axon terminals, because if you could think back to pictures of neurons, where do you see myelin? Only along the axon. You don't see myelin on dendrites, cell bodies, or at the very end of the axon terminals. White matter, the majority of the brain is composed of axons. White, myelinated axons. And what, what's making that white myelin? We're in the brain. So oligodendrocytes, right? So these are the oligodendrocytes making this. During brain development, the outer superficial, more gray layer, right, is coming from the ectoderm. Remember when I said back in tissue land that the brain Sorry, that the ectoderm, the outer layer of the blastula, went on to form your skin and your central nervous system. So the outer layer of your brain comes from the ectoderm, from that outer layer of the developing blastula. We call that outer layer the cortex. Everything on the inside is the medulla. Even the cerebellum has a cortex, so there's even a gray and white matter distribution in the cerebellum separately. Okay, let's take a look at a couple pictures. Um, I've already said this. White matter is where? Deep to the gray. Verse, it's flipped from the spinal cord. And again, the white matter is what? White matter is axons. A group of axons traveling together is called a tract. Those tracks are going to travel up and down the spinal cord in the areas called funiculi. Within the brain, where are we going to find the tracks? In the medulla, in the inside. But the brain is not 100% white. Okay, so in other words, if I look in the brain, kind of a Simplistic picture of the brain, right? But, but we've got lobes. If I were to look inside, ah, that's not good for you. I have no artistic skills. There's my brain. Okay. Um, keep it simple. So what do we have around the outside? If I took a slice of brain, that'd be the cortex, right? And what color would that be? Gray. Gray. The inside would be the medulla, and it would be white. But there will be clusters of gray matter inside the brain. Hmm. What are those clusters of gray matter called? What's a cluster of cell bodies? In the central nervous system? Nuclei. So what you're going to see is that in this, okay, so this is where the word nucleus comes from. Right? If you think back to when we think of a nucleus, what do we think of? a dark center in the center, right? So this is actually where it came from. The word nucleus was first used to describe these dark central areas inside the brain surrounded by white stuff. And that word got, you know, got people grabbed onto that word nucleus and then used it in other ways. So a cluster of cell bodies deep in the brain surrounded by white stuff is a nucleus. We know that that cluster is what? That cluster of cell bodies is, or that dark matter is a cluster of cell bodies, isn't it? So little cell body clusters within the white matter are the nuclei. Why do I tell you that? Because on this slide, I remind you of a couple things. Within all the mass of white matter, within all of the medulla, there will be clusters of gray matter. Those clusters of gray matter we know are cell bodies. And those clusters of cell bodies are called nuclei. Cerebral nuclei, just a fancy word for saying that the nucleus is in the center of the brain. If it were a spinal nucleus, it would be what? The horns, right? The horns would be the spinal nuclei. And then here's that reminder that clusters of cell bodies in the PNS, we would instead call ganglia. So we have ganglia versus nuclei. 
we have tracts versus nerves, and the cells that made the white stuff, Schwann cells versus oligodendrocytes. Those are those three parallel terms that I will need you to keep track of. Okay, so let's label some things. This is, this is comfortable, I hope. You're looking at a brain, and we're looking down into what groove, what separates the left from the right side of the brain. The longitudinal fissure, a fissure with a deep groove. It goes way down. Now, at the very base of that, the two halves of the brain are connected. They are connected by what thick band of tissue between the right and left hemispheres? You labeled it in your sheet brains, but we didn't really talk about what it was. That thick band that connected the left and the right is the corpus callosum. So if you could imagine, as you look down that, that longitudinal fissure, I can see where the two halves are connected. That is the corpus callosum, essentially. The corpus callosum is white matter, a.k.a. axons, that connect the right and the left parts of the brain. Now, there are people who are born without a corpus callosum. So what would their problem be? What would their unique situation be? Their left and their right brain can't talk to each other. These are really interesting folks. We're going to see in a few minutes that the left and right brain are really two separate organs hanging out side by side. The right brain is primarily controlling your left body. Your left brain is primarily controlling your right body. And if you have your two parts of your brain working independently, these folks can spend all day. One, one part of the brain is unzipping their pants, the other half is zipping them back up. And they're kind of working off from each other. They have very interesting uh, personalities. They usually tend to work, it's almost like they have two brains, right, that aren't talking to each other. So they have to integrate those two sides of their brain more deliberately. So once they get through that, they're better off. Now, what do we see on the whole brain? Two hemispheres, again, co connected by the corpus callosum. The outer layer is the cortex. We would say the cortex outside is made up of the gyri and the sulci. There is the central sulcus. We can't really see that here. But the central sulcus separates what? We've seen this on a colored brain. The frontal from the parietal lobes. Whenever you look at a colored brain image, the author is going to make you think that it's something easy to see. It's always so clear on a colored brain. But on a real brain, there's, no, there's not always a place where you can go right across and say, oh, that is the central sulcus. So we're not going to see it as easily. I'll always use labeled, colored labeled brains for those kinds of things. Next image. But that's the central sulcus. What about the longitudinal fissure? That's one we already saw, right? Separates left and right halves. And then what's the lateral fissure, folks? If I turn this brain sideways, what's the lateral fissure? Some books call it the lateral sulcus. It's the divider between the temporal lobe and the temporal and parietal lobes, as it says, right? Temporal from the parietal and frontal lobes. Let's turn this thing on its side. Now we can see things. Now it's colored. They're not the most beautiful colors, but they're colored. Let's get our orientation. When the cerebellum is here, it's pretty easy to get the orientation. Okay. So I see the cerebellum. Therefore, I know that way up here must be the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe, here's what I want you to know. Each of these lobes is specialized. There's a lot more than this. This is just an introductory understanding. But the frontal lobe is where your motor instructions come from. If you have a stroke and that stroke damages your frontal lobe, there's a good chance that you will have some muscle paralysis as a result. Okay? Because the frontal lobe is the area of your brain from which you send signals to tell your body to move. But this is also the part of your body that is your intentions. This is your higher functioning areas of your brain. This is also your area of inhibition. People who have damage to their frontal lobe may start doing things they never would have done previously. A person with damage to their frontal lobe may start undressing in the front window. May st Grandma may start swearing like a trooper. 
right? She'll do things she never, or he would do things they would never would have done because their areas of inhibition have been damaged. So if you meet somebody and they're just, their personal space isn't quite what it used to be, or they're doing inappropriate actives, activities, likely they have frontal lobe damage and or they've got some sort of paralysis. Again, the left side of the brain controls the motor movement of the right side. So if you had a person with paralysis on their right side, where's the damage in their brain? At least part of it's in the left frontal lobe. Okay, more about that. Now, what do we call a person with paralysis on half the body? We had quadriplegia, paraplegic, and hemiplegia. So hemiplegia would be half. Okay. Now, the parietal lobe is where information is coming up. So if you think about the brain here, let's take a look at this. Here's your spinal cord coming up, right? I go straight up. Whoop, where do I end up? Parietal lobe. So the parietal lobe is where the upcoming sensory information is going to. Not all of it, but most of it. So straight up the spinal cord goes to the parietal lobe. If you had damage to your parietal lobe, you would have problems understanding your environment. You might be able to move just fine, but you're just not with it. You're not understanding your environment because your sensory part of your brain has been damaged. A, a temporal lobe, this is pretty simple. Over by the ears, it makes sense. That's where your language and your hearing centers of your brain are. Damage to your temporal lobe could lead to problems with speech and or to hearing. And finally, the occipital lobe is where your vision is centered. And if you have damage to your occipital lobe, you might have visual problems. Now, I'm reminded of this one because of a personal uh, story. My, my grandmother, uh, my mother was five years old. So this is 1950-ish, 1950. My grandmother was skating, ice skating, and fell and hit the back of her head very hard on the ice. 1950, no MRIs, that kind of stuff. And she was blind within a month. I've heard week, a month, but very quickly she went blind, both eyes. So we know what happened, right? Now we know that she hit the back of her head, hemorrhage, was bleeding, damaged that part of her brain, and as a result, lost her vision. Now, if that had happened today, right, she would have had a massive headache, I'm sure. She would have gone to the ER. They would have seen the bleed in an MRI. They probably would have been able to fix it and probably would have saved her vision, right? But as a result, she went completely blind in a very, very short period of time. So that's what I remember. Hit the back of your head, occipital vision, and if you hit the back of your head really hard, you might see stars. Literally, you have made a, you've kind of shaken, if you will, your brain and your, your nerves that go to your eye. So just know those major parts of the brain. Now let's take a little bit deeper look. There's a couple more parts here that I want you to see. I don't have a cerebellum here. So sometimes when I don't have the cerebellum, it's more difficult for me to figure out front from back. So take a look at this brain. I don't have a cerebellum. What's my next landmark? Your next landmark, let me go back. I'm going to argue the next landmark is this. Oops. What is this? That is that transverse, or sorry, lateral, lateral sulcus, right? Lateral sulcus. Take a look at that. Now go here. Where's my lateral sulcus? Right here. Okay. So where, so what is that lateral sulcus doing? Separates the temporal lobe from the frontal and parietal lobes. So this is frontal, way up here. Okay. The cerebellum would be hanging down here, wouldn't it? There's a couple more landmarks I want you to see on here. Number one, the central sulcus. It's circled here for us, the central sulcus. Here, look how easy it is to identify. It is this major groove that separates the frontal from the parietal lobes. That's the central sulcus. I also want you to notice this groove is what? Again, this is the 
lateral sulcus or lateral fissure. And look what they've done here for us. In this picture, they've taken some forks, if you will, and they pried open. They pulled down and up on the lateral sulcus. And what's hiding back there? Another lobe. I mean, literally another set of gyri, another set of sulci, another lobe hidden back behind. That is the insula. You're never going to see that on a brain just sitting on a table or in a picture from just a, a superficial view. Right? It's always going to have to be going deep inside. Now, I want you to also look at this little guitar pick area right here. It's labeled as Wernicke's area. I want you to know that word. I'll come back to it in a minute. What lobe are we in? Lobes are we in? We're kind of on the, on the border of what? Temporal and parietal. This is an area, if it's damaged, is going to lead to a type of speech problems and this is referred to as the, as the Wernicke's area. This is going to give you difficulty understanding language. Makes sense, because where is it? It's on the temporal lobe, think hearing, and it's on the parietal lobe, think sensory. If a person has problems here, has brain damage here, they're likely going to have a type of speech problems or understanding where they don't understand instruction. They don't understand what's being said to them. I also want to ask you, which side of the brain is this? Is this the left or the right side? Left. So this is the left brain. And Wernicke's area is almost always in the left side. Okay. What we're going to talk about in a few minutes is that the left and the right brain are not mere images of each other. They're not simply you know, two halves of the same thing. There are some things that happen only in the left side of the brain. So there are some things that happen primarily in the right side of the brain. And both of them have to be talking to each other for the brain to be working in total. So they're not just mirror images, exactly the same, left and right hemisphere. There's another area on here that I want you to point out. It's not as well marked. It's, it's marked over here on the side. This little purple area is called Broca's area. B-R-O-C-A. And Broca's area is called motor speech area. If a person has a problem in Broca's area, what lobe are we in? Frontal. And I told you that frontal lobe was motor. A person with damage to this particular area of the frontal lobe would have difficulty speaking. Okay, so if you've ever met somebody with a stroke who has difficulty getting the words out, motor. They can't get their tongue and their lips and everything to work right. They've had damage to that part of the brain. If instead, after the stroke, they can speak just fine, but they're just not getting, they're just not understanding their environment, now you're suspecting that their damage was back in the Wernicke's area. Okay, so that'll kind of give you an idea as you meet patients who have had strokes, what some of their symptomology is and where their brain damage might be. Pretty, 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 pretty easy to see these things. Now, lastly, there's two pieces of land on here that I want you to see. Number one, let me change colors here. Do you see the blue and maize here? Okay. So this blue strip, it's what? One strip of land, one gyrus in front of the central sulcus. What lobe are we in? Frontal lobe. And that strip of land is called the frontal, or sorry, called the motor strip or the pre-central gyrus. Hold on, there's a slide coming up next. That's called the pre-central gyrus. Why? Because it's before pre, pre-central, before the central sulcus. It's in the frontal lobe, and we'll also call that the motor strip in a few minutes. Now, what about the maze list right behind it, right? So this strip of land back here, what lobe are we in? Parietal. We're on the post side of the central sulcus. So that's called the post-central sulcus. And what did I tell you goes on in the parietal lobe? Sensory. That is called the sensory strip. So the blue is the motor strip, the frontal lobe. The maze is the sensory strip in the parietal lobe. Okay. So let's just keep going from here. In this particular view of the brain, 
there is no cerebellum either. So you, it's hard to see that. You also cannot see any temporal lobe here. You're looking right on from the top. So what can we see here? Let's label what we can do. This is the... Ah. Sorry. Right, so this would be, like you said, the longitudinal fissure, right? Separating the two. And what would this line be? That is the central sulcus. That means everything on top of that, frontal lobe, right? Everything behind it, parietal lobe, yes? Way back here, in gray is the occipital lobe. We're not going to name that divider. Where would the pre-central gyrus be? On the previous picture, it was blue. So I'm going to change to blue just for consistency. Right? That strip of land, do you agree? That would be the pre-central gyrus. We are on the frontal lobe. And, to be consistent again, right behind it, what is this strip of land called? Post-central gyrus. Sensory strip. Now, what I'm going to do right now, you got to take your imagination. Imagine this is some weird cake, right? And we're going to slice, we're going to take a piece of, of cake, and the first thing we're going to do with this cake, just to get your orientation, we're going to slice the cake this way, right? we got half, left and right half. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this slice right there. I want that slice of cake. I'm going to take that slice of cake out, and I'm going to lay it down on a plate. So I'm going to take that little sliver out, and I lay it on a plate. Boom, there it is. Okay, let me help you with this. Uh, this is that pre-central gyrus on its side. Right, you took that chunk of land and kind of laid it on the side. The other name for this, again, was the motor strip. Okay, the motor strip. So this is the motor strip. We're in the frontal lobe. Do you agree? Now, what's missing here, just to get a complete appreciation, there would be the other half of the brain here. So what is this I'm looking straight down on? That groove would be the longitudinal fissure. And what is this little white piece right here? There would also be one right here, corpus callosum. So that's what's connecting the two halves of the brain together. And what is this groove right here? Lateral sulcus. And I showed you before, if I were to go into the lateral sulcus and pull up and pull down, what does this represent back here? There's the insula. Okay, just to give you a different perspective on what this image is. So what is this lobe down here? This is the temporal lobe. Everyone with me? So that's the temporal lobe there. The insula would be deep in there if I were to pull the lateral sulcus apart. And this is part of the frontal lobe because I'm in the pre central gyrus. And what you see in this cartoon representation is that there's this man and his body's been stretched along this section of the brain. The bigger the part of the body, the more information that's sent from that part of the brain to that part of your body. So in other words, there's a lot of motor neurons that go from your frontal lobe. This is your motor strip. This is the part of your brain from which you send instructions to move your body. And there's a lot of motor instruction going down your spinal cord to moving the muscles of your face, chewing, um, eating, swallowing, speaking, a lot of function going on right here, right, to make all this work. And there's also a fair amount of muscles and control that are necessary for your hand motion. And not as much for your feet. Okay, so a lot more for your face, a lot more for your hand, and not as much for your feet. Okay. So that's the motor strip. Now, keep in mind, there'll be another one on the other side. All right, this is just half of the picture. That's the pre-central gyrus or the motor strip. This is the same thing. Right here, same thing, just different colors. Same picture, right? So we see the dude, he's just a different car caricature, and we see lots of muscles involved with the tongue, Lots of muscles involved with the face, lots of muscles involved with the hand, not as many with the feet. This is literally the way your brain is mapped out. 
if I had damage, okay, let's say this is the right side of the brain, right, anatomic position. If I had damage to this part of my motor strip, what would I have paralysis on? If that part of my brain got damaged in a stroke, I would have problems with, if this was the right side of the brain, I would have problems with my left leg, right, I'd have paralysis there. Instead, what if I had paralysis, if I had brain damage, sort of the top of the motor strip on the right side? I'd have motion, I'd have problems with my upper arm, wouldn't I, with my upper limb. And if instead I had damage on the lateral outside edge of my motor strip on the right side, I would have issues with swallowing, movement of control. Okay. Okay. Now, that is the motor strip. But also, right behind it, what do we call that strip on the parietal lobe? Sensory strip. This represents the sensory strip. Now, what do we see? It's the same idea, right? This is the area of your brain that's receiving signals up your spinal cord. Again, it's very similar. There's a lot of sensory. Your, your tongue, do you agree, is a very sensory rich area. Your face is very, you know, lots of nerve endings. You have fine control over feeling and touch and your taste, your tongue, your face. You also have lots of fine motor control and sensation in your hand. You have less in the rest of your body. So that's what this is showing. The only real difference between the right and the left side is that sensory region, there's a genital region here, and there's no genital region here on the motor, motor side. Other than that, they're kind of mere images. So let's, let's, does that make sense? I'm gonna go back to this, to this picture. Where are we right here, folks? This area was Wernicke's, right? I told you if you had problems with Wernicke's area, what was gonna happen? Understanding language, look where we are. We're kind of on that, we're next to that sensory strip area, aren't we? You wouldn't be perceiving it. And look where it is, it's on the outside and it's very lateral. Let's go ahead. If I had lateral damage, what am I gonna have problems with? On the outside, speaking, right? I'm not gonna have, if it's a motor, Right? Motor areas, I'd have problems speaking. If it was on the sensory side, I'd have problems understanding. All that stuff coming up. I want to jump. I may come back, but I want to make sure I don't run out of time. I want to jump over this little bit on the divisions of the brain, and I want to go to the cranial nerves. Before I do that, though, let me give you a five minutes. Okay? So five-minute break, get some brain juice flowing. And I'll come back in five minutes. I'm going to jump over, just so you know where I'm going. I'm going to jump over through this. I'll come back and do this on Wednesday. But I'm going to jump over right now when I come back to this section back over here that says cranial nerves. So this is where I'm going to pick up. But I will also entertain any questions you have. Where are we going? A couple more slides. What page is this page on... In your packet, cranial nerves begins on. There we go. Where do you have this? 138. It's so where we'll be picking up. And everything I just skipped over, I'll come back to on Wednesday or even have some time today. But I want to get through these last slides on the cranial nerves. So let's take a quick break. Five minutes, we'll come back. Any thoughts so far on the brain? Parts of the brain? The hardest thing I've done so far, I mean, the parts, we kind of got some of that down. Hardest part is this motor strip, sensory strip stuff. And that's also anatomy, isn't it? I mean, it's a little bit of function, but it's also anatomy. Let that sink in. And let me turn over to the cranial nerves. Now, the cranial nerves, I think, are really fun to learn. They are very, very practical to learn. These are the nerves that control your special senses. So when I say, what are your special senses, what comes to mind? Taste, smell vision, hearing, and balance, right? Those are your five special senses. And we always forget about balance. But those five senses are going to be controlled through these cranial nerves. These cranial nerves pop off your head, pop out of your brain. The spinal nerves popped off your spinal cord. The cranial nerves pop off your cranium from your brain. And we're going to see that they control, like I said, vision, hearing, smell, taste, and balance. 
There are 12 of these nerves. These 12 nerves each have a very particular function that you're going to learn about. So the anatomic location of them is not important. But if you were to turn the brain over, literally cranial nerve number one is way up here at the top, and it anatomically goes all the way back to number 12. Now, these nerves are always written in Roman numerals. They're not written in Arabic numbers. So Roman numeral 1 through 12. So anatomically, they're just simply 1 through 12 if you turn the brain upside down. I'm not going to ask you to label this, okay? So don't worry about this image. But they're all named here. I'm going to go through these 12 nerves. As I go through these 12 nerves, there's three things you need to keep track of. Number one, the name. I'm going to go through the order 1 through 12, the name of the nerve. So as you see on this slide, the first nerve, CN1, cranial nerve number 1, is called the olfactory nerve. The second thing you need to know, do, figure out is what does it do? It kind of makes sense. The olfactory nerve is in charge of your sense of smell. And then once you figure out what it does, I want you to ask, is this a sensory nerve or a motor nerve? or both. In spinal nerves, right, when we're talking about the 31 spinal nerves, they contain both motor and sensory fibers. But cranial nerves sometimes are unique. So look at this one. This is a sensory only. Okay, so this nerve only carries sensory information. It's coming from your nasal area and is going to your brain. It is giving you your sense of smell. That's it. Okay, now I'm going to give you mnemonics and some ways to remember this in a few minutes. I've also got pictures of each of these. I wouldn't have you label any of these. This is just to kind of put it all together. So what you see here is that this is the nerve. It comes way up here, way towards your frontal lobe. And these little nerve endings come down into your nasal passages. These are chemoreceptors. They pick up chemicals from your smell. And this is why if you are, have a cold or you're clogged up, you don't smell as well. Because if you had more mucus in this area, then those smell molecules wouldn't be able to permeate through those layers of gunk. So if you've got a clear sinus, you can smell better. If you have um, gunked up sinuses, then you're not going to smell as good. That nerve, right, that's the olfactory nerve on the outside. But once it gets in the brain, what do we call it? The olfactory Tract, okay? So you'll see that word tract or nerve. These are all nerves because they pop out of the brain. But once they're inside the brain, that same thing that we call the nerve would continue as what we would call the tract. Same thing, okay? Just a different location. Number two, you've seen this nerve. It was the one popping off the back of the eyeball. In the model and in the dissection, that was the optic nerve. The optic nerve is also called cranial nerve number two. This is also a sensory only nerve. All this nerve does is carry information from what you see, sensory, and goes out the back of the eyeball and goes to the brain. Now, where does this nerve primarily travel? Where in the brain does it mostly go to? Where did I tell you the visual centers of your brain are way back in the occipital lobe. So you have to imagine that somehow this information from the optic nerve travels through all the way to the back of the brain and ends up on the occipital lobe. Okay, So it's a vision. It allows you to see and it is a sensory only nerve. It has no motor function. It does not move the eye. So let's take a look at it. There's the eyeball coming off the back of the eye. Right there it is the optic nerve, and the optic nerve comes down underneath the brain, and then it kind of crosses over, and then we see that it goes right where? Back to the occipital lobe. Information coming in on the right eye, not all, but much of it goes to the left side. Some of it does cross over, some of it may not. So you'll see some of it does cross over the other side, some of it does stay on the same side. So what would we call that? Same side? Ipsilateral, other side, contralateral. Number three, ocular motor. It tells you what it does. 
It moves the eye. This is cranial nerve number three. It is a motor nerve. In other words, it has no sensory function. It does not perceive light. It only moves the eyeball. And it does so in a very predictable way. This is the nerve that controls your up and down movement. So when you move your eye up and down, that up and down movement, the up and down movement would be the ocular motor nerve. Now the other thing this does allows you to do is to look cross-eyed. So if you all look at your nose right now, cross your eyes and look at your nose, that movement of your eye to go inward is also the ocular motor nerve. So if you can go cross-eyed and you can look up and down, your ocular motor nerve is working. Okay. The other thing this nerve does is it constricts your pupil. Now when does your pupil constrict? It gets big when you're scared, right? Your pupil constricts when you are more relaxed. So when you're relaxed, your pupil constricts, a hole in your eye constricts. That is ocular motor. Okay? So if a person had problems with their ocular motor nerve, they wouldn't be able to see up and down. They wouldn't be able to move their eye up and down. They wouldn't be able to look at their nose. And their pupil would be enlarged, right? They wouldn't be able to constrict their pupil. It would, temp it would look large. It would look blown, a blown pupil, right? their ocular motor nerve is somehow damaged. Motor only. Here's a picture of it. Not, you're not going to memorize any of these, but here comes the nerve, comes in, and there are these cool little muscles that control the movement of your eye. And there are muscles that move your eye side to side, little muscles that move your eye up and down, and muscles that move your eye at an angle. These particular, this nerve comes in and touches the muscle on the top and on the bottom, right? Up and down. And the one that rotates your eye over to see over to your nose, cross-eyed. And it also goes to your pupil. You see the nerve fibers coming in, and they go to the pupil to constrict it. Motor only. No sensation of light, simply the movement of eye in a very particular way. The fourth nerve is the trochlear nerve. Where have you seen that word trochlea? In the elbow, right? The trochlea, that term means pulley. Picture the humerus for a second. Picture the trochlea. Can you imagine a rope going through that trochlea? Okay, the pulley. The trochlear nerve has nothing to do with the, with the humerus, but we're going to see in a moment that there's a pulley-like structure. This is also a motor nerve, the trochlear nerve, cranial nerve number four, and it moves the eye in a very particular way. If you're standing in anatomic position, right, you have your palms down to your side, you're looking forward. If you can look down toward your palms, down and out, that's the particular movement of the fourth nerve, and that's all that nerve does. It's the only thing that does. The fourth nerve only moves your eye down and out, as if you were looking at your hands down in anatomic position. Again, not to memorize this, but here's that nerve coming in, and look at this, isn't this cool? This muscle comes in, goes literally over this little loop-de-loop -loop up here and then attaches to your eye. That's the trochlea, the little pulley. And it literally pulls your eye at a weird angle and allows you to see down and out. Cool little muscle. Okay. Number five. Remember, these are not numbered in any meaningful way other than their anatomic location on the brain. Number five is called the trigeminal. Tri, three parts. It has three branches, an ophthalmic, a maxillary, and a mandibular branch. This is your first nerve that is mixed. It does both sensory and motor. This is the one that allows you to move your jaw, to eat, to chew. Your masseter is connected to this. If you can chew, then your fifth nerve is working well. But this is also a sensory nerve. If you can feel your forehead, feel your upper jaw, and feel your chin. Three regions, trigeminal, right? If you can feel all three of those regions, then all three of your branches of your trigeminal nerve are working fine. Try three parts of your face plus chewing. It's motor for chewing. It's feeling sensory for feeling your face. Again, look at this nerve as it comes in. Big old nerve. It goes up to your forehead. Can you feel it? Can you feel the top of your jaw? Can you feel down in your mandible? And it controls the muscles of mastication, your chewing muscles. 
here are those three regions. So if you couldn't feel up here, right, the ophthalmic branch might be broken, or if you couldn't feel here, your maxillary, or here, your mandibular branch. Don't worry about the individual parts. Just remember, try. Three parts. Number six is the abducens. When you see this word, I want you to think abduct. We're back to the movement of the eye. To abduct would be what? To look away. So abduct is to look in your peripheral vision. So to look outward to your peripheral vision is your abducens nerve. This is number six. It's peripheral vision. Motor only. No sensation of, of sight. That was number two. Again, you have these little nerves coming in, these little muscles, and this particular one is what allows you to, you see it here, it's attached to this muscle, and it allows you just to look outward. Right? It just pulls the eye to let you see outward. Number seven is the facial nerve. This is also a mixed nerve in that it's both sensory and motor. The sensory portion is your sense of taste in the front two-thirds of your tongue. So if you can taste in the front two-thirds of your tongue, the sensory portion of your seventh nerve is working. It's also, however, your um, muscle of facial expression. If you can pucker your lips, move your cheeks, and kind of make funny faces, funny faces are your facial nerve. So if you can move the muscles of your face, that's motor. And if you can taste in the front two-thirds of your tongue, that's sensory. That's the job of the seventh nerve. Again, look, it's coming in. And it's going to all the muscles of your face. If you look at it, you'll see it has branches up to the forehead, around your eye, all over your facial muscles. And it goes to your tongue. Can't see it so much here, but it's going to taste on the front of your tongue. And when you're tasting, you better be making saliva. So you, this also tells your salivary glands to make spit. Number eight. You've already seen this nerve. This nerve goes by three different names. This is the one you saw in the ear model. Sometimes it's called the auditory. Sometimes it's called the cochlear. Oh, sorry, vestibular cochlear. Right? Vestibular cochlear, that's what it was called in our lab manual. Or here, the auditory vestibular nerve. It has a bunch of names. It is the nerve that is sensory only. It is carrying your hearing information and your balance information. The hearing information is coming from where? Hearing is coming from your cochlea. And the balance is coming from the semicircular canals. So inside that, that inner ear, you've got two parts of this nerve. Those two parts then become the eighth cranial nerve. Sensory only, no motor. It's nothing, not telling you to move. It's simply receiving balance and hearing information. The ninth nerve, the glossopharyngeal nerve. What does that, nerve, that name suggest to you? Glosso, tongue, pharynx, throat. You're picked just by the name of it. You're thinking tongue and throat, something in the back. Okay. This is your gag reflex nerve. This is the taste in the back one-third of your tongue. So you've got um, the back. If you can taste in the back and your gag reflex and your swallowing, all that is much your ninth nerve. So we take a look at it. comes in, and it goes to, again, deep in your, in your throat, swallowing, gag reflex, tasting in the back of the tongue. That makes it sensory, uh, but it's also gag reflex, which is motor, right? So it's motor and um, sensory. It's a mixed nerve. Number 10, vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is the longest nerve and biggest nerve of the cranial nerves. It travels all the way from the head down to your gut. Vagus means to wander, okay? So this is your wandering nerve. It travels all the way from your head, travels all the way down, wanders all the way down to your gut. It goes to your bladder. It goes to your stomach. It goes to your heart. It goes to your lungs. And it's picking up sensory information. Right now, how do you know if your bladder's full? Your vagus nerve. How do you know if your stomach's empty? Your vagus nerve. How do you know if your blood pressure, if your heart's beating fast or slow? vagus nerve. It's sending information up from your gut to your brain. It's also motor because this is also your um, articulation. If you're speaking, if you can articulate, that's your 10th nerve. So speaking, screaming, shouting, 10th nerve, motor, and sensory from the gut. 
This is also your brain freeze nerve. Right? When you go to 7-Eleven and you get a smoothie, what happens? Right? You take the first couple of sips of that Slurpee, and all of a sudden, sometimes, what do you feel? Brain freeze? What's happened? You've actually frozen the vagus nerve in your stomach, and you're feeling that pain up in your head. Okay? So you've actually frozen that nerve lining your stomach, and that 10th nerve, that vagus nerve, is you're sensing the pain, though, up in your head. We'd call it referred pain, wouldn't we? Right. We, we sense it's a headache. Actually, what you've done is you've frozen or affected the nerve in your gut. Some people feel brain freeze in other places, but usually up in the head. Yep. Again, that tenth nerve, if you turn the brain over, all these nerves are coming off what? The base of the brain. Okay? And it's right by your soft palate. It's right there at the top of your roof of your mouth. Fair enough? Think, think about where those nerves are coming up. They're coming up from underneath the brain, from front, number one, to the back, number 12. Now, just to look at it, okay, we're looking at this, and it's wandering. This nerve is wandering all the way down, right, to your gut, your intestines, your stomach, your liver, your lungs, but it's also your larynx, your voice box. Number 11, this is the accessory nerve. It is a motor-only nerve. If you can shrug your shoulders, if you can turn your head and your sternocleidomastoid. So this nerve goes from your head, but it controls the muscles of your neck and of your shoulder and of your sternocleidomastoid. We know the sternocleidomastoid. We know the trapezius. Those muscles are controlled by this 11th nerve, the accessory nerve. So here it is coming down, right? It's going to your SCM. You know your sternocleidomastoid. And it also comes down and talks to your trapezius. Finally, we have the 12th nerve, hypoglossal, under the tongue. This is the, the nerve that makes you or allows you to stick out your tongue and move it. It's a motor-only nerve. It just simply moves your tongue. So again, it comes around, goes underneath your tongue, and lets you move your tongue. Have you ever had your cranial nerves tested? Have you ever had your cranial nerves tested? Every time you go to the doctor, follow the light. Follow my finger. Can you feel this? Say, ah, ah. Shrug your shoulders. Move your head. What have I just done? I just tested all your cranial nerves in about 13 and a half seconds. The only cranial nerve we don't test for is smell. Right? But honestly, think about what I just did. Move, can you follow the light? You're seeing it. Can you see it? You're moving your eye in all the directions. So number two is being tested by, can you see it? Three, four, and six are being tested by, as you move your eye in different directions. You looked up, you looked down, you blinked. You said, ah, ah, you said something. That was 10. Um, you uh, stuck out your tongue. That's 12. You shrugged your shoulders. And the doctor is watching these things. They're, they're just kind of watching it as part of a normal, complete exam. You're watching for those cranial nerves. And again, if a person's complaining about them, then there might be what? Brain damage, something going on in the cranium. Really cool to understand these cranial nerves, and they're not going to go away. So we're going to learn them well. We're going to learn them now. Now, on Blackboard, let me go there now. I have put a learning tool for you. There are some mnemonics for this. This is one of them, and this makes no sense in and of itself. It's simply 12 letters, but each of those letters stands for the 12 cranial nerves in order. Here are three common mnemonics. Oscar's old ostrich tasted tomatoes and felt very good, vomited, and how? It's weird. On old Olympus's towering top, a finely vested German viewed a hawk. Oh, once one takes the anatomy final, very good vacations are heavenly. Whichever one you choose to memorize, the first letter of the phrase is the first letter of the name of the nerve in order from 1 to 12. So memorize, if you like, choose the one that you like, choose the one that makes sense. If you don't like these particular mnemonics, go online, type in dirty mnemonics, and you will get very, very colorful <laughs> mnemonics, ones that I can't publish here. And sometimes the dirtier they are, the easier they are to remember. Okay? So if you want to find those, just type in dirty mnemonics, and medical students have been making up lovely phrases for years. Now, the second set down here, Sally sells mega monkeys, but my brother sells bigger, better mega monkeys. That phrase... The first letter tells you if it's a sensory nerve, a motor nerve, 
or both. You choose if you like these phrases. It's going to help you remember. Some say Mary Money, but my brother says big brains matter more. Some say Marilyn Monroe, but my brother says Bridget Bardot, mm -mm. whatever. These phrases are going to help you remember the name of the nerve and if it's motor, sensory, or both. Then the name of the nerve kind of tells you what it does sometimes. Ocular motor, abducens, trigeminal, three parts. It'll help you. How am I going to test you on this? Will be as follows. I will give you a little story. Jeff could hardly believe it. Here he was sitting in the middle of all these pre-med students waiting for the final exam. What next, he wondered. Suddenly he heard. Which cranial nerve allows you to hear? Number eight. Or vestibular cochlea. Professor said notes away. The time had come. He blinked his eyes. If you can blink your eyes up and down, that was number three, ocular motor. He wiped the sweat from his forehead and felt his heart beating quickly in his chest. Anything down here in the gut would be number 10 in the vagus. Uh, if his stomach was a knot, he felt nauseated, that would also be vagus. So here's some tools for you. We'll finish up with this. On Blackboard. I don't want to misspeak. I want to show you where it is. Maybe you noticed it. So I'm going under Blackboard. I'm going under Lecture Materials, and I'm going to our lecture number four, right? And under here, what you're going to see looks like this. Here are the notes. And then cranial nerve preparation sheet. This is just a word, one word document. And it goes through a little story. Um, so there's the beginning I just shared with you. And it just continues. He read the, what is your name? He smiled. If you can move the faces, you know, the facial muscles and smile, that would be number seven. You'll get it. Facial. He smelled. Number one, he salivated, seven and nine. Um, so you go through it. He shrugged his shoulders. That was the number 11, the accessory. He stuck out his tongue, number 12. He heard something, number eight. He smelled something, number one. He saw something, number two. He moved up and down, number three. You're going to get the pattern of this. Then right after this article, this file, also on Blackboard, right below it, are the answers. So cranial nerve preparation with answers. And here are now the answers in there. So print out maybe the first one. And then check your answers. Please, please, please. I'm giving you a whole week on this. That's why I wanted to jump ahead of the cranial nerves. I know it takes a week for this to kind of settle in and make sense. Flashcards, maybe. Learn these mnemonics, 1 through 12. Um, know, if the, know the name. Know what it does. If it's muscle, or sorry, if it's sensory, motor, or a mixed or both nerve. Have fun with this, and that's how I'll test you on the exam. I will give you a little paragraph like this, and you will, multiple choice, tell me which nerve is involved, blinking, tasting, smelling, seeing, whatever. Okay, so if you can, try to do that before Wednesday, at least look at it, so you can ask any questions about it before Wednesday when I see you again. I'll see you all, some of you tonight, some of you uh, again on Wednesday, and that was a good, perfect timing on today's lecture, I think.